All right, ladies and gentlemen. So we wanted to start with that song, which is a classic uh, from the early 90s, not just because Bruce Springsteen starts it out there and singing a little bit, but uh, that song, We Are the World, uh, interesting piece of history there, but it was, a, it was a song of, you can see, seven minutes long. Basically, anybody who was famous back then, from Michael Jackson to Bruce Springsteen, got together to sing the song as a fundraiser. It'd be an interesting thing for you to go back in and research, but the idea that we in the United States have a responsibility for people all over the world is kind of where the question came from. And so that is something, this is like this classic kind of corny show of unity. This is something everybody can agree with. The question is, how do we help people around the world? That's the big question, right? And that's this idea, this economic idea that we're going to look at. But the idea is coming from this song, we are the world, we're all here, everybody's coming together, famous people, people you never heard of, uh, Willie Nelson, my dad's favorite musician. But the point is, how do we help the world? And that's really where this economic question comes from that we've started to talk about. So you should have a paper copy uh, that looks like it has these slides on it, and we're just going to fill in those blanks here. The other thing I'm going to ask you to continue to do is just think about who does uh, flipped lessons well. Is it your math teacher? Have you had a teacher in the past? And so then at the end of the year, you can give me some feedback on things I can work on. Now here we have this sort of picture of this great uh, ACT word utopia. Now, maybe you don't know what the word utopia means, but it's kind of this idealized perfect world. The idea that somehow we can create a community that's a utopia or everyone's happy, everyone's holding hands, looking out in the beautiful future with some sort of space age castles. So this is an idea of a utopia. Really communism tries to push humanity towards this system of utopia, this perfect world. Now there's a big, big difference between the ideas of communism and the way that they've been used, the goals and the practices. So we need to be able to differentiate between what are the goals of communism and what are the actions of people who have tried to use communism. So real basically, you probably already have these defined on your assignment, but communism is an economic system which means it has to do with money and goods and services, that engineers the sharing of resources and economic equality, which means no one's going to be very rich, no one's going to be very poor. If you think back to the clip we watched, this is what the hostage takers wanted. This is what those young kids wanted to create, an economic system that was more equal because they were so obsessed with how rich the hostage was and how there were other poor people. Now, in communism individual people lack the freedom to start businesses because you might start a business because of what's best for you but it might not be best for the sharing of resources or for economic equality so in communism there's less freedom but in theory more equality which is like this big philosophical question what's more important to you equality or freedom now this is one of the reasons that communism scared a lot of people in America. It's not a basic part of communism, but it is one of the things that scared a lot of Americans. Several of the founders of communism were anti-religion because they said there's all these poor people in the world and religion makes them feel like, well, I might be poor and there might be a lot of rich people, but at least I have my religion my hope for a future in heaven or nirvana or wherever. So the founders of communism, at least many of them, didn't like religion. They thought it was a tool used, they even call it a drug, used to keep the poor satisfied with their unfair life. It doesn't mean that everybody that believes in communism believes that, but this is one of the reasons why the United States is leery or downright afraid of communism. And again, practice versus theory. In theory, Communism's goal, this idea of a utopia where everybody's holding hands and looking at the sunshine. In theory, communism ensures that each person's life would be valued as a member of the community in communism. Each person's life would be valued as a member of the community and not just if they're able to be a great worker. So the idea is like everybody's important on the basketball team, not just LeBron James, right? Everybody in our community is important in communism not just the people who are the best workers. This is in theory, and we know that in practice it didn't always work that way. So that's a brief explanation of the economic system of communism. But here's what we have to remember, that there's a political system that, way, that is a way the government operates, not an economic system, the way that the money and the jobs and the construction is worked, but a political system 
called totalitarianism. Totalitarian system is a political system, that is, how do we have leaders, how do we have laws, how do we have police, this sort of thing, in which the government has total control, totalitarian, total control over citizens' lives. So in the Soviet Union in the 1950s, that was led by this guy named Joseph Stalin. And you can see by the way that he's depicted in this picture that he's looked at as this great total leader that will lead the Soviets to a better life. Today, Kim Jong-un, for the most part, runs a totalitarian political system in North Korea. You might remember we looked at that uh, video clip earlier in the year where they control the TV, they control uh, where people live and work, all this sort of thing. Now, that's different than communism, but most countries that have had communism also use this totalitarian political system. You've made a communist on the street. He might not tell you that you need totalitarianism, but we've never seen it. That's where we talk about the goals of communism versus the practice of communism. Most places with a communist economic system have used this system to make sure that resources are shared and that if you are critical of the communist system, that you are silenced, either permanently or put in jail. Most places that use communism in human history use totalitarian government to force people to share and to silence critics. Communism doesn't say you need to do that, but that's the way humans have chosen to do that. Now we flip over and we talk capitalism, right? So capitalism is the economic system that you're familiar with, even if you didn't know you're familiar with it. And it relies on competition to decide how resources will be used. This goes back to the hostage taker, or the, sorry, this goes back to the hostage and the pencil video. This is the system works on its own. Whoever gets the best idea wins. It's based on competition and, and distributing it based on that. So in this system called capitalism that we have in the United States, individuals take risks. And it is a big risk to start your own business. And the pencil video would add that because people are free to do what they want, they're allowed to be very creative. Look at how many different ways you can eat fast food. Now, maybe you've only lived in Minnesota. You've never had an In-N-Out burger. You are missing out, but not enough to take a trip to California. Regardless, the fact that you can sell fast food in all these different ways is a good example of an economic system that relies on competition. In the Soviet Union or in North Korea, if there even would be a fast food restaurant, which there really wouldn't be, it would just be one restaurant. It would just be Soviet burger and cross all these out and it would just be Soviet burger. Okay. Now, again, quick review, not as much here, but some people lose because their business ideas don't work out. And if we go back to the hostage takers, this is what they're so upset about. You are working a system where people are going to lose, right? So this idea that if you work hard, you're going to get it, get where you need to be, is existing within this idea that in capitalism, we know that some businesses, if there's a competition, you can't all be winners, right? There were some fast food restaurants that failed, right? So some people lose because their business ideas don't work out, or they get a job and that business closes, or they learn how to dig holes, but now we don't need to dig holes because of robots. This is the idea of competition, and it's built into the economic system of capitalism. It allows for freedom and creativity, but it also requires people are going to lose. We've been talking about democracy all year. You know that democracy is a system of government where people get to vote. They don't do that in a totalitarian system. Could you have a communist system that's a democracy? For sure, we have socialist systems. Socialism is halfway in between our system and communism. And there are lots of countries in Europe that have some form of socialism where there's more equality, there's less freedom, more equality, but people still get to vote. The downside of that, of course, is that you're paying high taxes. So those are the two different big systems, both economically and government systems. And as hard as it is to keep those two ideas separate, we got to work on that. Government, how decisions are made by laws, leaders, etc., total control versus voting, economic system, capitalism versus communism. Now, this part is the part that's really going to get into what we're talking about, which is 
how these big ideas relate to history. The first thing it led to was a Cold War between superpowers, right? So this is the first level down at the point is going to be Vietnam, which is what we're studying. But at the big picture level, we have a Cold War. Just quick review, the United States was a democratic government. The United States was a capitalist economy. The Soviet Union, which includes Russia and other places, was a totalitarian government with a communist economy. A Cold War was between these two countries. And it is a serious conflict between two countries, but it lacks direct military action. You don't trust them. You treat them as the enemy. But there's not open warfare with bomb guns and planes. There was plenty of that during the Cold War, but it was secretive and on different levels. So we have this Cold War that kind of shades everything that goes on after World War II until basically I was born. Okay, The next level down would be a proxy war. A proxy war, and these went on during the Cold War, is a war between two groups that's supported by other groups who are trying to push their own interests. Right now in Syria, there's a war going on between Syria, the government, and Syria, the rebels. But it's also a proxy war because other groups, like Russia, the United States, Iran, France, the list goes on, they are supporting either the Syrian government or the Syrian rebels. So we have a country or a war between countries one and two might be secretly supported by countries X and Y in an effort to benefit those countries. Today it's going on in Syria. Back during the Cold War, it went on in a lot of different places, including Vietnam. And then the other key part here that a lot of people leave out is the idea of an independence movement. Many countries have been taken over by other countries, which we already defined as imperialism. Many countries often, like the United States did to Britain, push for their independence. And sometimes they try to push those imperialist countries out using violence. The United States did this. It felt like the British were imperialists, were taking from them. So the United States pushed them out in the 1700s. Other countries look to do that as well, including the Vietnamese people looking to push France out. So that was a rapid intro to a couple of key ideas Communism versus capitalism, democracy versus totalitarianism, and then in the international scene, how does this play out? First and always, you've got the U.S. versus the Soviet Union. Sometimes both countries supported other wars to get their advantage. And then finally, there were countries totally separate that just wanted independence. Thanks.